So I landed in Beijing in 2005. About two weeks earlier, my teacher in America turned to me and said, Joey, you're going to China. And I was like, what? And basically that night, I called up my mother and I said, Mom, I need a ticket to Beijing. Luckily, she bought me one, but she thought my teacher was extremely crazy. I showed up to Beijing two weeks later as a stupid American. I thought actually people spoke English. Well, I was rudely awakened. And um, completely naive, I didn't even really prepare myself, but I found one program to basically set me up in Beijing with a host family. So I got off the plane, ended up there, and I saw this woman. She had my name on it, on this huge sign, and I said, okay, I'm going with you. She brought me to this tiny little ghetto shack in downtown Beijing, actually the southern part of the city. And she stopped the car, pointed to a building, and said, 18th floor, room 1804. This is at 2 a.m. in the morning in hot Beijing heat. And um, basically, she dropped me off and left. I never saw her again. And so I'm at this place, and I have like, okay, trust yourself, trust yourself, trust yourself. And I go to the 18th floor. So the elevator, of course, is turned off. I'm walking up these stairs. I get to the 18th floor, and I start knocking on doors. And, of course, all the numbers are in Chinese. <laughs> so I keep on knocking and knocking, and no one opens up the door. And then I'm realizing, okay, I'm actually on the 17th floor because the first floor starts on the second floor. So I get to the 18th floor and I keep on knocking and finally, someone opens up the door. And they let me in and I, I mean, I'm telling you, I look like a washed up drug addict. I'm completely soaked in sweat and I'm surprised she even opened up the door. But I go in and I become part of this family. Now the father was this taxi driver. Okay, and every day he would come home and he would strip down to his tidy whities because they had no air conditioning. And I'm telling you, these tidy whities weren't that white. And he'd, <laughs> and he'd sit there and fart. And I'm telling you, this was completely normal. And um, so I got a lot of courage, okay, living in this place. And uh, finally, I had to take a shower, you know. It was about the second day, and I was like, you know what, I kind of smell. I need to take a shower. And I jump into the shower, and now the shower is probably about the size of this red circle. And I'm sitting here and, you know, basically putting soap on my body, and the toilet's right there. In comes the father. Okay, I'm like, shit! And um, so basically, what I realized was that Beijing is all about function, okay? He had to go to the bathroom. The toilet wasn't being used, so it made perfect sense. You know, I started out my career as a potter, which is also all about function. I made things of use. Um, these are things that I made off of uh, patterns of my favorite boxers, the, pu the buttons, and then my favorite pair of airplane manuals here and there. So from there, I started ho learning how to understand the culture. And through ceramics, I first had to understand in China how to speak the language. So for me, what I did first was relate it to previous sounds. So to understand hello, which is ni hao, I understood from the ni, and I understood how a Native American would say hao, ni hao. The second thing that I learned was bush agenda. Now, bush agenda means um, it's not real. Now, again, trying to relate it back to my previous experiences, I related it to the bush agenda. And from, th <laughs> and from there, I kept on going. Now, when I first got to Beijing, I started working with communities of people. Um, and I first started taking these ceramics, these, basically these teapots, and I worked with Beijing taxi drivers, and I made this huge Christmas tree made out of 2,000 teapots. And it was this incredible feeling where I was taking this kind of exotic element of America that people in China thought was extremely weird, and I would be jumping to a taxi cab and basically talking to these guys and say, OK, come to my studio and tie string around pots. Um, believe me, they thought I was extremely crazy. But it turned into this amazing thing where I started actually learning about the environment as well. Um, I took taxi drivers as well because I wanted to take less cars off the streets and lower emissions in my tiny little part because Beijing is actually one of the most polluted cities I've ever lived in. I mean, now I actually have to wear a mask to go out into the streets most days because the pollution is that bad. So then I started working with ice. Now, Ice is this extremely incredible um, material that you can manipulate in so many ways. And I started talking about global warming. So I went to three different rivers in Asia. I went to the Yangtze, the Yellow, and the Ganges. And all rivers affected by glacier melting. And basically what I did is I built this 
huge army of ice children in 90 degree heat in Beijing in the summer of 2009. And it was at that moment that I realized that art itself can do so much. It could change a person's opinion of the world, their ideas of how things work, and also get them behind something as, as big as the environment and doing many, many other things. But it's also a function. You know, art itself, to me, has always been like the pottery. You know, painting sits on a wall and just sits there. But sculpture can really involve the community. So then I started working with coral. I found this amazing way that I could be turning into an alchemist. I could see some seeable magic. And what I did was I started working with this technique of sinking this metal underwater, electrocuting it, giving it life, and using this mineral accretion process where the metal would turn to limestone. Basically, how it works is you take these two different cords, a negative and a positive, and you bring it to this structure, and it's kind of like a battery. And a battery works with two different metals reacting with each other and creating these electrons. Um, so basically what you do is you're kind of doing the same thing with the anode and the cathode, and you create this ionic field where these electrons travel through to the cathode, and it basically takes calcium out of the water, magnesium hydroxide, and it cubulates on the metal, and you get these amazing structures. You know, I'm turning these metal things underwater into whole new coral reef, reef, reef systems. Basically, within about three days, you have this calcium coating around the metal. And, you know, it, it, it is. It's like, for me as an artist, you're an alchemist. You're turning something of just tiny, simple material into something of gold that you try to sell to people or you try to convince people to buy. Um, basically, this is the second day. And then you, you work with these modular structures. So I've been working with these modular structures recently. And... <laughs> Oh my god, it's amazing. And coral is actually this amazing, amazing animal. I never thought of it as an animal, but it is. It's alive and growing. And same with pottery. It, this is doing something for the environment, as well as the ceramic pieces I was making and all those other things. So basically how it works is you take these structures, you build them on the side of the, uh, on the beach, and then you sink them. And then you do these reef rescue missions where you take coral that has fallen off of reefs and you take it and then you attach it to the structures. And it basically comes back to life. It actually grows five times faster when it's electrocuted and raises the threshold of the temperature it can withstand. So the ocean to me has not always been something I've been obsessed with. I only became addicted to it over the past few years. For me, I was born a lake guy. And I always thought of ocean people as somewhat trashy. Uh, somewhat like Jersey Shore here, this, uh, this very trashy American TV show, which, in my opinion, is actually quite genius now when I look at it. But it, I didn't realize in the beginning how amazing it is. It's this exotic world. To me, every time I go underwater, I think I'm like Neil Armstrong landing on the moon. I float down to the dusty surface as if it's moon, and I look up at the top as if it's Earth thousands of miles away. But what's interesting is it's within reach. Jules Verne once wrote, on the surface, they can exercise their iniquitous laws, fight, devour each other, and indulge in all their earthly horrors. But 30 feet below the sea surface, their power ceases, their influence fades, and their dominion vanishes. Oh, monsieur, to live in the bosom of the sea, there I recognize no master, there I am free. For me, Beijing itself was a sense of freedom. I could walk down the street and be looked at no matter what I was doing. So I could paint myself purple and be looked at. Which, to me, I felt this incredible sense of freedom. Living in China, lacking Chinese blood, I will always be different. But bit by bit, the restraints are no longer confining. They become invisible. To, to me, there exists a parallel consciousness between the sensation of being submerged to the act of living and finding my place in a never-changing China. It became a correlation of two exotic places where I exist as the non-native. Learning to utilize as well as tune out the chaos of China was much like being engulfed by the quietness of the sea, where communication is based by what you see, not what you hear. The term exotic seems to be an historically and politically charged word. I do like the exotic, but perhaps not in the way that might first spring to mind, because it's not something we necessarily fetishize or objectify. Rather, it is something within each of us. For me, living in Beijing, it's a city of concrete, communism, and, and basically coal-polluted air. But I 
think of coral and I find something within it and something within the sea because for me, the exotic is not some place we escape to, but rather a place we find answers in. In Asia, my status will always be a foreigner, yet I am no different from any artist, wherever they might be, whose aim is to set out a moral and adorn a tale. Mine, a story of how a young man raised in upstate New York can be influenced by and influence a culture other than his own, bearing a language that bears repeating. Thank you.